Hello and welcome to Digital Construction Conversations, brought to you by MBS. I'm your host, Paul Swaddle, and every episode I'll be talking to interesting people connected to the digital construction industry. After a number of recent discussions had made me think more about the role of information managers, I was keen to arrange an interview with somebody who knows that role and its place in the BIM process inside out. Iftikhar Ismail, Deputy BIM Information Manager for Jacobs. I've known Iftikhar mostly via LinkedIn, where he regularly posts incredibly helpful guides and contributes wisdom and experience in complex discussions on subjects like virtual design and construction, parametric modeling, and smart technologies. With over 20,000 followers, Iftikhar's updates and documentation have helped so many in the industry, and thousands more access his digital guides on shortcuts and tips that he collates to save managers time and effort in platforms like Autodesk Revit, Navisworks, Synchro 4D, Celebri and Viewpoint, and using data exchange formats like IFC and Kobe. A member of the Institution of Engineering and Technology, Iftikhar has in-depth knowledge of digital engineering, BIM standards and process implementation, not just from an academic perspective, but from extensive experience of the day-to-day practicalities of coordinating and producing models, drawings and details for large-scale, fast-moving and collaborative projects. Not only that, but even with his deep levels of technical experience, he manages to present a friendly, warm, and humble attitude when assisting and correcting fellow BIM professionals. And I really enjoyed our chat together. Here's a pragmatic and forward-thinking conversation with Iftikhar Ismail. Welcome, Iftikhar. I suppose the first question that might be an obvious one is how the last 18 months have been for you and how the pandemic has affected your work and the way that you deliver it. I think the main thing, is, especially in our field in, in construction, and if you're working in a in a large team, um, the thing I miss most is about the the one to one contact with people. Uh, that's that's where I enjoy my time most working as a group, uh, whether it's with architects or engineers. You know, just um, you know, just turning your head over and asking somebody a question. Know, resolving issues, um, you know, just walking about, uh, and, and people chit chat. You know, whether it's in the, the lift or at the kitchen when we're making tea. You know, what projects people are working on, what others are doing, what kind of problem areas they've had. So I, I miss that interaction. I think more than more than anything else. Yeah, yeah definitely. I agree that the one to ones and the informal chats are missing. What are your plans in terms of working from home and? And blending that with being in office environments or needing to be on site, you know, in um, at work. You know, I'm working on a lot of uh, large government projects, so a majority of people will still be working from home at the moment. I have been into the the office uh, once, um, you know, with, with this new role, and uh, I, I'm I'm just looking forward to getting back in the office. You know, that's where I think I get actually more done. Everybody's got their own kind of um, preference, general preference. And for me, a mixture of both, you know, homeworking and working uh, as a team, you know, just fleshing things out. It's uh, it's what I prefer. One of the questions I always start with is how you describe the work you do, reducing jargon as much as possible um, in terms of BIM and digital construction and explain your role in the simplest terms. If anybody looks me up, whether it's on LinkedIn or elsewhere, they'll they'll see that I'm traditionally architecturally based. So that's my kind of background, you know, interior design and architecture. And I started off, um, you know, I've been in the industry 20 plus years. uh, And there, there was a chap in one office and he always used to refer to himself as being the nuts and bolts man. And that's 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 where I come from. I'm a nut and bolt man, so I do all the kind of nitty gritty. And majority of my career is spent uh, producing a lot of documentation and a lot of drawings that the builders use. You know, traditionally, you know, we print off all the drawings. Uh, drawings they go to site, and then the builders will use those drawings and build whatever it is, whether it's a hospital, a school project. So I was, uh, you know, one of the designers and technicians traditionally, um, you know, producing that information. Everything has slowly changed uh, with the advent of BIM. And 
you know, a lot of these processes now have become digitized. So there's less drawings on site. You'll see more tablets. Uh, you'll see more kind of, you know, virtual reality technologies, headsets, you know, these things like uh, robotics, um, which are making life uh, a lot easier. And there's less and less visibility of drawings. It's good to hear that, though. I think perhaps from my perspective, it's harder to see how well those technologies are being implemented in the real world. We see the advent of them. But it's great to hear that you're seeing more tablets on site and VR headsets in practice and you know that technology being used um, on real projects and, and in practice. Uh, with this new role I'm in, the BIM manager asked me yesterday, she says, um, where do you see yourself? Are you more towards the modeling side? Are you more towards the information management side? And come to think of it, I, I never thought about that initially. But yesterday I had to kind of pause and I was thinking I'm probably about 50-50 now. I'm a mixture of both. Before I used to be maybe 95% hands-on, the, the modeling and the technology, you know, producing the drawings, the specifications, and five on the kind of admin side, the management side. But now it seems to be more of a kind of a 50-50 split. And, you know, it'd be interesting, I, I may even ask, you know, other fellow information managers where they see themselves. And I think that's quite an interesting point she raised because she was looking for help on... Um, you know, things like, um, you know, uh, BIM accreditation, whether it's BRE or the BSI accreditation. And I think it's good to have uh, knowledge of both areas. Not a single day is the same, you know. Um, traditionally, when I was working in an architect's office, I know that I've got to produce a set number of drawings by the end of the week. So every day is fairly similar in terms of what I'm doing nine to five. But because of my role currently, you know, every hour is different. That's fantastic. I, I'm really keen to talk about the information manager role and, and we'll get to that. Um, I'd first like to hear your description of digital construction and BIM process from your perspective. You know, we hear so many different definitions and ambitions of uh, BIM in particular, but in terms of day-to-day -day reality, how is building information modeling being implemented um, on real projects? I mean, when I got involved in in uh, the kind of BIM arena, um, my step into the BIM side from the architecture side was via the, the, the master's course at the University of Salford. And at that time, um, they were kind of pioneers of, of BIM um, and, and pushing BIM for, you know, UK wide. I think at the time when when the course came out at the University of Salford, there were only two in the world. One was at um, Stanford and the other was at the University of Salford. So they've had a head start when it comes to pushing out BIM and, and kind of VDC, uh, you know, education. So I used to think uh, BIM is about 3D modeling, but it's now been honed in to me. And I absolutely agree with the teachings at the university that BIM is about people process technology. You know, it's, it comes down to those three kind of uh, areas. Technology being the, the easiest to implement, the easiest to learn, and uh, people being the most kind of difficult area because trying to convince people that have been doing the same thing for 5, 10, 15 years is, is difficult. And, uh, and I've found that out as well in every organization. Um, even if it's something as simple as uh, a naming or numbering convention. Uh, I mean, when, when it comes to the basics of, of BIM and information man management, everything is based on codes and processes, and they're all given a number or a digit. And, uh, you know, we've been given guidance um, via the, the BIM task force originally 10 years ago. Uh, in 2011 and we've got this whole suite of documentation currently with the ISO 19650 standards that we can follow so we've got great guidance but there's still a lot of um, you know issues and you know whether they're applicable to current projects and it's just uh, trying to um, please everyone you know you know, you know. What, where I found it a positive is that if you do some what I call hand holding and show them how life can be a lot easier than, um, you know, if you show them practically, 
you'll you'll get them on board. You know, you'll get them on board. So, um, I mean, it's interesting because I've just had a chat with uh, a 4D expert this morning on, on the BIM side. And I was telling him that, you know, it, it's okay going to a lot of these talks, uh, exhibitions and conferences. And when people talk about, you know, whether it's BIM, VDC, robotics, etc., cetera, um, and, you, and you see these flashy presentations, it, it's great, um, you know, visually. But in terms of using it practically, there needs to be guidance. Uh, and when I mean guidance, I'm, I'm more um, interested in kind of step-by-step -step guidance. How do we implement it? You know, at kind of a ground level. I've been tasked with my new role to look at producing and implementing 4D and 5D BIM strategy uh, for, for Jacobs. And to do that, it's not just a kind of high level presentation. We're looking at the, the kind of nuts and bolts, you know, how, what, how, how do we implement it at grassroots level throughout the, the organization at their kind of critical mission solutions projects? I mean, it's, it's challenging, but I find it, I find it, you know, great. You know, everybody's at a different level. I appreciate that. And I'm here to help them, you know, on, on their journey. Yeah, that's absolutely talk um soon about the 4d and, and 5d and how well that might happen in reality one of the reasons i was so keen to have you on the podcast is that approach that's so straightforward and practical your guides and information that you share tend to be at that grassroots level of this is how you do the thing in real practice and sometimes what you hear in conferences and in presentations can be quite fluffy or aspirational but you seem to provide a very pragmatic approach in reality. Is that something that's important to you? I see myself, uh, I mean, I've, I just wrote here that I see myself as a sayer and a doer, you know. So it's it's okay saying something, but I like, you know, showing it and doing it as well and telling people this is how it should be done. Um, I mean, for example, uh, I've been looking at, you know, uh, clash detection and coordination and uh, various technologies like, um, you know, Revit, Synchro and Navisworks. And, you know, I, I've got a lot of good knowledge and expertise that I can feed in and help people. If I see something and I think, you know, why did they do this? They're making life very difficult for themselves. Um, you know, why don't they try this an another way? And it could be so, you know, much easier and streamlined that will make life easier for themselves. And the step-by-step -step guides that I have available and have produced and um, they're supposed to make life easier you know and i'm will i'm welcome to you know criticism also when it comes to working with colleagues you know currently and in on previous projects i do say to them what i share to you is my best practice knowledge if you think you know there's a better way stop me in my tracks you know I, I'm, I'm all for that i'm all for learning it doesn't matter if you're you know, 25 year old graduate, it doesn't matter if you're 50 years old, you know, I'm all for uh, further learning. So I have said to my team currently that I'm going to show you some techniques, how you can make life easier for yourself. I'm not here to make life difficult because some people, some people do think that, you know, when, when, when they think this BIM professional, you know, or specialist, he's coming in, he's just going to make another layer of confusion, add another layer of confusion on top of the project, you know. If you think that there is a step we should maybe look at or cut out or avoid or reevaluate, then I'm all ears. Yeah, evolving those processes and based on feedback. That's fascinating. You mentioned it briefly, but I think it would be interesting to hear about your career path and, and how you got involved in construction and architecture um, and your progression into BIM roles you know, that you're doing today. Although I'm living in, in Manchester at the moment, I'm originally from Glasgow, uh, Scotland. So, you know, back, I've been in the industry now 20 plus years. And back when we were at school, we had subjects like, um, you know, craft and design, technical drawing. You know, um, when, when it came to um, drawing um, machines, bolts, et cetera, et cetera. You know, just on a, on a, on a wooden board with a, with a T-square and pen and ink. So, you know, when I studied at university, everything done by hand at that point, we were still, you know, 
uh, in a kind of a pen and ink world at that time. But I didn't hit the CAD uh, arena till after university. So all my university work at that point, when I when I finished, was done by hand. But that was where my interest was in kind of 3D geometry, you know, drawing, uh, producing that information. And then I got a step in the CAD arena. Slowly that kind of uh, progressed. And then I realized um, things were going to turn towards the 3D side. And I only realized that happened was when the recession hit. It was 2008 with the recession and then 2010, the only work available was, um, you know, using Autodesk Revit and, 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 and producing that information. And there seemed to be a kind of a, a back step on, on the 2D side and more interest in the, in the 3D side. And at that point, I decided to take a night class, learn Revit at night class. And this, this to get... Um, going again on, on the on the 3D side. And since then, uh, so you could say it's probably since uh, 2010 then, if I, any opportunity I have, I always try and learn new skills, new digital technologies. And even, even to this day, when I'm mentoring students in terms of their research and dissertation, and one thing I always say to every student that I, that I, that I help is that never stop learning. You know, this is an endless endless circle. So technology is changing rapidly. It's changing every year, every other year. So keep learning, keep learning new skills because it'll come in handy. Yeah, you're an exemplar advocate for lifelong learning and developing skills constantly over the course of your career. One question I'm keen to focus on with your experience and knowledge of various paths in BIM is the role of the information manager. Can you describe what that role is? I would say it's um, producing kind of a step-by-step guide in terms of how projects are delivered. I'm not only producing the guides, but I'm kind of checking and validating them at the same time. So when I say producing the information, I made reference to, you know, the, the ISO 19650 and the PASS suite as well. So as an information manager, they'll be your kind of Bibles, you know, you know the, the past suite originally, and then currently the ISO 19650 guide. So what you do is from those guides, you'll produce the, the project information, you know, whether it's, uh, for for example, in employers' information requirements or a BIM execution plan, you'll produce that information, you'll validate it, and you that'll be your kind of Bible uh, that you'll use in projects. And that document or those suite of documents are updated on a kind of regular basis. So as an information manager on projects, you'll have access to those suite of documents. They could be could be three, they could be several documents, they could be even 50 plus documents, but you'll be involved in, in managing, producing, validating, and policing the, those suite of documents as an information manager. That's a really helpful definition. Brilliant. So how much of that information that you're creating can be standardized from project to project? And how much needs to be specific to the particular aspects of the project that you're working on? In terms of standardization, if you've got your, let's just say, your perfect BIM execution plan or perfect uh, document on the project, then in terms of, uh, you know, tweaking it, it's probably 10% is required. You know, it's, it's minimal work. But what I found now with, you know, uh, working within several organizations is that the quality varies, you know, from one extreme to the other. Some and, and people will say that I, I say this one BIM execution plan in one organization might be absolutely dreadful. In another, it could be almost perfect because you can actually use it on a day to day basis. So for me, whether it doesn't need to be necessarily be you know a BEP or an EIR, but any documentation that you can place next to your keyboard or laptop and you can refer to on a day to day basis, you've actually you've got a winner there. That's such an interesting way of looking at it. I suppose when you describe the perfect BIM process and these documents like the BIM execution plan and responsibility matrices, that can suggest that there's an idealized process that should be taking place. So how much flexibility do you need to build into those processes and those systems 
to make them adaptable to the day to day, how feasible is it to deliver a consistent level of quality on any project and have the processes and plans in place to be able to uh, to do that? Yeah, I mean, definitely you can. There's, there should be that flexibility inbuilt within these documents that so they are flexible and you can you can update them. Um, but usually the, the best documents usually have a checking process. So there'll be somebody who actually produces the information, the documents, and then it's better to have somebody who checks it and validates it. So that way the, the document is continuously refined. So the, the, these things I've come across like, um, you know, the, there's two examples that stand out when it comes to uh, documentation and information in some of these documents. One is the, the list of models that you have, for example, on, on a project, because it, if it's a multidisciplinary uh, design team working on a project, you'll have several, if not dozens of 3D models um, on a project. And the naming convention might vary across all disciplines, across, you know, even in one single project. So the best projects I've worked on have a concise naming convention across all models and that and they are individually listed within uh, a document whether it's uh, you know an EIR a BIM execution plan or another document so they'll be listed out so that come initiation and the project has started and people are wondering okay you know we need to start and we need to get this um, you know model set up correctly everybody knows that you know this is the template or this is the naming convention we're using and it needs to be up to date. It needs to be accurate. And I mean, an another example is LOD as well. Up to now, the majority of documents I've come across refer to the US system, LOD system. I think there's a, currently there's only like one or two in the past couple of years that refer to the UK LOD system. So they, I mean, the, the UK LOD system uses single digits, you know, LOD two, three, four, five, etc. Whereas um, the US system and the global um, system uses three digits. So I find that there's a bit of confusion there because people keep referring to the US or the kind of globalized LOD system. And uh, is this some of these updates that need checking and tweaking in, 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 in these documents? And because those processes have evolved, especially in global organizations, how much commonality is there, you know, where you're seeing different definitions for level of detail, for example? Is the fundamental goal still the same, which is to have that developing evolution of information across the project timeline? How much will changing requirements affect that consistent outcome? Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the end goal is the same. Um, you know, for every project and for every organization. Um, when I was having my call this morning with this, uh, with my, you could call him my 4D guru, um, I, I was telling him in multidisciplinary organizations, for example, like like whether it's uh, Jacobs or Ecom, you know, they've got a lot of offices in a lot of different countries, but the the information varies, you know, from from a lot of organizations. The, the information in one city might be a lot um, less mature than in another city, in another country. But the good thing is with a lot of these organizations, there's a lot of expertise in-house. Um, so you don't need to create something from scratch. So what I've found out is that with my current role um, and having joined Jacobs quite recently in the past month, I've um, I've noticed they've got nearly I think 180 maybe 200 BIM professionals globally. So if I need to produce uh, or create a 4D and a 5D BIM strategy for projects, it's probably 99% possible somebody's already created that or undertaken that task within the organisation. So the good thing is you can tap into that expertise. Yeah, that's a fantastic lead into another question I have, which is how the practical nature of what you do and the ability to evolve that process is something that can be repeated globally. And clearly, BIM processes seem to be fairly mature in the UK and you've mentioned the US levels of detail. There's other countries that are implementing 
their mandates and are, and are noted as being further on there with their BIM initiatives. So how much can BIM and digital construction be truly international in that sense? I think the, the best example for me is I could, if, it, if a project is undertaken using uh, ISO 19650 BIM standards in this country and they're taken by uh, an organization, let's say in the opposite side of the world in Australia, if you pick up a drawing or a specification, you'll understand right away you know, what that drawing or what that specification is about through, for example, the naming convention and through what's required in that document, whether it's a BIM execution plan on this side of the world. If I pick up a, a BEP on the other side of the world, I know exactly what I am looking for, you know, looking for in that document and what I hope to expect to see in that document. And if it's undertaken using the ISO 19650 standards, there will be some deviation, you No, know, but you, I would expect about 80, 90% similarity between the two. So that's the great thing about having standards um, and standards being used globally, you know, by, by organizations. Yeah, certainly that drive, as you've mentioned, from the PAS suite of documents, influencing and, and adapting and evolving into the ISO suite now as an international standard. How much are you seeing ISO 19650 being adopted on projects, as opposed to perhaps more familiarity with PAS and, and the BS 1192 centered mm -hmm. approach? Uh, the PAS suite is still being used currently because it's been in existence, you know, for the last 10 years and came out in, in 2011. It's still being used. The ISO 19650 standards is still relatively new, although it's been around for uh, a, f a few years. There will be um, a kind of a time lag you know, or a crossover time between um, the PASS suite and the ISO 19650. The great thing is the, ISO, the pickup of ISO 19650 globally is, is more evident, you know, in, in, in a lot of countries. So I think there's, there's probably that kind of crossover. For, for example, if, if uh, you know, if there's a project going over in the Middle East and I was to jump onto that project and they're using 19650, because of, you know, we are kind of pioneered 19650 here in the UK, there will be a lot of familiarity, you know, in terms of documentation. And as an information manager, you know, their suite of documents will be very familiar and I, I would know what to expect. And in terms of that evolution and digital transformation, what's your experience in terms of how clients and contractors are beginning to adopt or understand the processes being used, you know, maybe five or 10 years ago, BIM process was still quite design and construction focused, but hopefully that's, you know, there's more informed clients and the need for the golden thread of information across the process timeline. And for us at use and reuse, um, to take that information for their own purposes. So what's your experience of the wider project? team and the clients um, becoming more understanding of the process? I, th I think the, the clients are becoming more knowledgeable when it comes to you know, BIM, new technologies and uh, the requirement for good information management on projects. You know, come five years ago, the, the concept of BIM information manager came out you know, traditionally, we've had BIM managers around for 10 years when, when basically uh, Revit and 3D technologies came out uh, in, in architecture and other disciplines. So we've had BIM managers around for a long time. But in terms of information managers, it seems to be um, a, a requirement. Yeah, it's, it's, it's basically more recent because uh, the project has so many different, you know, um, uh, characters, uh, disciplines involved, and there's so many crossovers that an information manager more or less pulls all of that together uh, on, on, on projects. So I'm not only working for uh, you know the client side, but I'm working for uh, the G Jacob side as well, and for the, the people that are you know pushing out the information from their you know laptops and desktops uh, in terms of drawings and specifications so i've I'm, I'm i'm working side by side with a lot of different people 
to make sure that uh, the project gets gets through. And I think that's what the information manager does, you know, especially hands-on information managers. And you'll know, people know that I'm hands-on when it comes to producing the information and taking that information all the way through from from beginning to end. Yeah. In terms of that, um, one thing I was keen to speak about, the last time we caught up, I think you'd mentioned one of the frustrations you had was around the time and the cost particularly the financial impact in being embedded into projects to allow for really good BIM process to take place. So are good quality BIM processes being costed into projects earlier now, or is that still a bit of a battle? It's critical, absolutely critical. And the, I mean, the example I'll give you is that, you know, a couple of years ago, I was I was let, basically let go uh, of an organization and, the, the reason for that was because, um, you know, the director came up to me and said that BIM was not a requirement on this project. He, he was absolutely right. BIM was not was not costed into the project and was not um, a, a deliverable for that project. So what we're finding is that clients are becoming more knowledgeable and uh, they see that there is that requirement now. BIM is you know, it's a, it is a digital deliverable and it is a requirement on a lot, if not most projects now globally. So that I think uh, thinking is changing amongst contractors, amongst, um, you know, commercial practices, organizations um, right across the board. So that fascinates me, you know, in all of the conversations about digital construction that I've had for a decade, there's always been this end goal on the horizon in terms of when this building needs renovation or when this asset, you know, the FM team need to have access to information, the information will be there because of the BIM process that we're putting in place now. Are you able to see examples now of projects far enough along their life cycles mm -hmm. to say, look, these are tangible benefits that we told you would happen. And look, this is a practical case study actually applying to asset management? If you look at the lifespan of a project or a asset, you know, 70, 80% of the, the overall cost, as you know, is in the asset management side of the, of the project. And clients are becoming more and more aware that they need to, you know, uh, they need to get um, in with the designers and the architects and the engineers right from the get-go, you know. So that information is embedded within the models uh, within the project so that they get the right information out when they get handed the key to their asset, to the, to their built asset. I mean, in the last two years, I've noticed there's a lot of talk about digital twins, you know, and again, I'm all for digital twins as long as it's, um, you know, useful at a practical level. So for me, if any if anybody who talks to me and who knows me that when you talk about things like robotics, artificial intelligence, you know, um, VR, AR, it has to be practical, um, you know, and be able to implement it on projects. There's no point talking about it and waving your arms and saying that, yeah, you know, we're doing AI, we're doing robotics, and we can do this and we can do that. And it needs to be defined and, and it needs to be implemented on projects. One example I can give you is uh, 5D. Although currently I'm looking at, I mentioned this briefly earlier that I was looking at the 4D and 5D side, and I'm having difficulty finding um, good quality case studies for 5D implementation of projects because it's still a relatively new area. How do I go and meet the architects, the engineers, and say, we need to do X, Y, Z so that we're ready to produce or, you know, or hand over to the client a 5D model that they can use for costing, you know, at construction stage and for asset management stage? Isn't that, yeah, indeed, isn't that a critical aspect? I think defining what are the steps that we need to take or the foundations that need to be in place in order to get the most out of this particular process. So for my benefit and for those of the listeners, could you explain what 4D and 5D are in simple terms and how you foresee them being used on projects? 
the 4D side in, in simple terms is just uh, it's to do with planning, planning the project visually. You know, for example, when I was having this call this morning, um, talking about 4D is that an example I can give you is that when you see some of these beautiful 4D simulations, you know, you can see the building going up, you can see the cranes going around it. And um, I asked him the question, you know, that crane, that static crane, was it, was it, was the question asked, you know, how did they get that crane on site? Is it possible to get a static crane on site? Is it possible to get, you know, if you can't get a static crane, does it need to be a mobile crane? And if it's a mobile crane, is the road wide enough to take that crane onto site? So for me, I, I look at everything at kind of a practical level. And in terms of the 5D side, 5D is implementing, getting the cost automated from the, the 3D models. You know, I, you have a 3D model of an asset or anything for that matter, and you can extract the the costings from that and i think at the at the moment the only industry where that's possibly happening to you could say perfection is manufacturing you know obviously there's this car manufacturing there's the the aerospace industry as well which uses a lot of automation a lot of robotics so you you could probably get really good cost estimation in the manufacturing industry it's bringing that technology and those processes through to the construction side yeah, I think there's there's so many interesting threads you've mentioned there. One that catches my attention is the idea of seeing the project in its context, the access routes, the way that plant and vehicles move around it, how roads are going to border the site, that the project doesn't exist in isolation like an island, but that it's part of an urban infrastructure or some inaccessible greenfield site, and that all of that needs to be considered as part of the project as well. Yeah, no, definitely. You have to look at the, the the practicalities of, you know, what you're producing, why you're producing it, and, you know, does it really work? You know, one, one of the things, one of the things I've been told to do is when I look at the 4D strategy, look at, look at what if scenarios, what if this happens, you know, then what do we do in that case? How can we have, how can we avoid two or more trades clashing on site, you know? Uh, what happens if uh, we get bad weather one month? How is that going to delay the project? You know, um, could we look at you know another side of the project as well? So there's a lot of what if scenarios you can look at with the, with 4D BIM, and I think that will come through slowly. You know, it'll come in through slowly. So maybe a couple of years ago, they were you know you'd hear about one project, you know, every couple of months that's using 4D, but I'm I'm starting to hear about it on a daily basis really almost. So it, it looks like, um, you know, when it comes to information management, you know, 4D, 5D, um, digital twins, et cetera, et cetera, you know, a lot of, there's a lot of talk about about these, you know, uh, technologies and it's, um, yeah, it's becoming more and more common. So it's great. And what's your experience of, of how BIM has evolved to capture information, you know, the I in BIM and data management rather than just being 3D modeling and, and drawing production. Clearly, you've mentioned cost and time or, or construction and cost. At MBS, we've always been advocates for this idea that BIM is not just graphical and not just 3D and that it's about the data, the specification and access to the properties of the objects and how they develop over time. Are you noticing a greater development towards that definition or understanding of BIM among project teams and, and particularly the owners of, of built assets? Yeah, de definitely. In the, la in the last couple of years, I've noticed that there's more focus on the data that goes into the geometry. There's no point having um, 3D dumb kind of, um, you know, digital models like we had 20 years ago with with regards to uh, 3D AutoCAD. You know, we'd had AutoCAD models and they were static models um, they couldn't do anything. There wasn't any data attached to them. You don't know what they meant. But now, um, you know, it's it, it, it's fantastic when you when you look at something, a three D model. When you touch something, you know that has data behind it, uh, and it's great. It's got a size. It's got a depth. It's got a specification. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's great. More and more organize organizations are finding the benefit of having that data. 
uh, within the models because they know that that information can be extracted, can be automated, can be used on the 4D side, on the 5D side, can be handed over to the client as well for uh, you know asset management and facilities management as well. You know, so so it's becoming more and more critical. Yeah, that's great to hear. And so I suppose to get more into depth about your role, what would a, a typical day look like for you or for an information manager on a on a given project? A typical day, I mean, for me, again, when I mentioned it, it kind of varies from, from hour to hour on, uh, yeah, on, on a daily basis. So I might be looking at, um, you know, a process or a number of processes um, with, with regards to documentation. Uh, refining that and in the afternoon I might be running clash detection and coordination on, on a project with with a large team um, and showing them you know uh, where the, the, the critical clashes are where the, the key areas they need to be looking at so sometimes I'm working in isolation on, on a particular part of the project on a piece of project and the next hour I could be in a large meeting and, uh, you know, we're sharing information and we're sharing back best practice and we're trying to just sort out any, any problem areas within the project. So every day is, is, does tend to be different. And, you know, if, if you have time in the day, you, you're always learning something as well. You know, you're always learning, you're always refining something because as an information manager, I'm less hands on the actual um, modeling side. But I'm more involved in um, data management and the coordination side of the projects, you know, finding out uh, what the real issues are and making sure that the teams are kind of connected together. They're all talking to each other. You know, that's that's basically where I come in. So I'll take, I might take the model from the architects, the engineers, the landscapers, the civils, combine it, review that, you know, review the information, see where the problem areas are getting the teams together and this iron out some of these issues uh, on, on a project. I suppose, was that a conscious move in your career? You know, we mentioned your background in design and architecture and interiors. Does that mean you don't get to do the hands-on development and modeling? Or do you even see information management as a creative outlet? Yeah, I mean, I do miss the the, the modeling output, but... I find ways of getting around that, you know, and, and for me that, you know, looking at the, the for, for example, looking at the 4D side and the class detection and coordination side, I'm still got a foot in the door when it comes to, you know, being actively involved on, on the modeling side. But in terms of producing the modeling, probably less so, I'm more producing information out of those models. So I've, I've got, um, you could say that, the, the seat's been turned around. So before I was producing the, the modeling, but now I'm actually checking it, validating it, and, and seeing that it's it's pushed through in the right manner, using the, the right technologies, the right naming conventions, et cetera. So I, I try and uh, keep a foot in the door when it comes to the hands-on side with, with the modeling. So um, yeah, I think that's the mix I like. You know, I, I don't think I'd be happy completely in the information management side, and now I probably won't be completely happy just churning out models and information. I like a mixture of both. So to to get into the detail of some of that, what are the platforms or tools that you tend to be using every day? The the tools at my disposal is majority um, within the, the Autodesk suite of products. So looking at, for example, you know, you, you've got Revit, Inventor, and then we're looking at various um, 4D tools as well to link with, with the 3D models and uh, produce the, our active 4D what-if scenarios. So they, they're the kind of main day-to-day -day tools we're using. And the other thing you'll find, and that in the last couple of organizations, they started having um, their own kind of dedicated dot control team within an organization. And they have their own kind of CDE within an organization. So a lot of um, a lot of one of the requirements of 
an information manager is sometimes working with the dog control team and maybe even managing or helping, you know, upload information onto the, the common data environment. So that, again, takes quite a lot of time as well. Um, I'm interested in that. You mentioned drawings and printing and plotting onto paper is something that's becoming more archaic. But in terms of the collaboration and sharing you do, does it tend to be, I guess, digital versions of paper outputs, PDFs, basically? Or are you beginning to see real sharing of 3D information and models themselves or real-time collaboration, you know, that sort of thing? There's, there's a mixture of both in terms of sharing uh, information. Um, one of my colleagues recently did ask me about, um, you know, how long we're going to be still using drawings. And uh, I, I had to say, we, we, you know, drawings are going to be around for a, still a long time to come. You know, there was a discussion around, uh, for example, PDFs. PDFs is, is a universal format, you know, for, for information, whether it's... Uh, reporting, you know, specifications, drawings, etc. It's a, it's a universal format that's used globally. And, uh, you know, this person was asking me about, you know, wh- when are we going to stop or will there come a time uh, that we stop using PDFs? And, you know, we're just a long way off. What about IFC? What are your thoughts on open source, you know, ways of sharing data in 3D? Yeah, de- I mean... There's definitely a benefit for for IFC sharing um, across across platforms and across um, disciplines. The, the, I think the, the the main issues I see with with IFC is still the data integration and also when it comes to uh, coordination, um, multidisciplinary design coordination with regards to with with, with regards to IFC. Problems with coordination, I mean, in terms of matching like for like models, I may have a model that's done in Inventor or in Bentley and then matching that with an IFC model sometimes can be tricky. So there's still there's still some work that can be done. But as an as a universal format, I think it, it, it's fantastic. One stupid question, perhaps, and one born of not being involved in day to day projects anymore. Within an execution plan or early stage BIM documents, is it still the case that specific software platforms are being defined for the whole project team for ease of sharing across multidisciplinary teams? Or are you seeing more cross-platform ways of sharing data? You know, say a company or a subcontractor was using a non-Autodesk product in your case, are you still able to use that data or are they needing to use similar platforms to be part of your project? Yeah, there, there is definitely more uh, interoperability between uh, software packages. I mean, one of the p- recent posts I've put up on LinkedIn it was to do with uh, taking um, 3D coordination models uh, to VR. And I was actually very surprised. There's a dozen, if not more, organizations globally that are able to take um, you know, 3D coordinated, you know, joined up models through to VR. So yeah, I think interoperability is becoming more streamlined across disciplines, across uh, digital platforms. And, that, and that's fantastic. I mean, one of my, what, one of my um, you know, pastimes is looking at VR and AR technologies. And in the future, I want to be able to be, bring in 3D coordinated models that can be viewed virtually you know, um, whether it's a headset or whether it's using holographic technologies. Um, and to do that, um, you know, the technology is still in its infancy and it's still very expensive, but it's becoming more and more, you know, cheaper and more and more economical to use as, as, as time goes on. So that's something I'm looking at. And it seems to be that uh, there is that kind of joint up uh, approach now within digital platforms so that interoperability has become more easier and more streamlined across disciplines and uh, to be honest across countries as well yeah mbs have integrations with autodesk graphsoft Archicad, and vectorworks and now some of the common data environments too and it's really important from 
my perspective that we remain aware of how many different platforms there are and, and what's being used in practice. A couple of things that jump out there, you mentioned the potential for virtual reality, for holographic technologies. When you think about future focus technology, what are the things that really excite you or practically make you think, if we could just get this bit working, it will make the day-to-day so much easier? Yeah, I mean, one of the things I was looking at is um, a product called Microsoft Mesh. And uh, there's a there's a hol- 3D holographic table that an organisation has produced or come up with in Australia. So if you remember, um, I don't know if I may be showing my age, but uh, Star Trek uh, Generations when they had their holodeck. What I was what I was thinking is, wouldn't it be great? Is instead of having the 3D model, you know, on a flat screen on the wall, bringing the team together, wouldn't it be great if we could actually have that 3D model in the middle? Of, of the meeting room on a table and we can actually pull it apart. We can see where the, the sticking points are, where the coordination issues are as well, instead of having it on a, on a flat, you know, a digital monitor or digital screen on, on the TV. And, you know, companies like Microsoft are looking at it via, via this product called uh, Microsoft Mesh. And, uh, you know, this organization in Australia that have come up with this 3D holographic table. So that's that's the way I see technology evolving. And for me, that brings practicalities to coordination. You know, it's uh, it's something that is tangible and uh, it can bring benefit to organizations and to the construction industry today. Can you talk about the reality of that and collaboration for say something like clash detection previously have you all tended to have to be in the same room for those discussions or when you're working with remote teams you know how easy has that been and has the advent of 18 months of digital acceleration made that process any easier you know what are the realities of digital collaboration um, in your project experience i think that the the technology and the fact, you know, we're living in unusual times with COVID now so that, you know, a lot of people are working from home and a lot of the coordination I've done over the past year uh, and longer has been like this, you know, looking into a monitor, working with the multidisciplinary teams across several locations uh, around the UK and globally. Uh, and and trying to run a coordination session. So it has become a lot quicker, a lot better. Um, What I do find is that it's nothing beats sitting around a table and uh, ironing, you know, issues out um, so that, you know, everybody gets their kind of input in because, uh, I mean, yeah, I think it's definitely, uh, the technology is there and it's definitely a a lot better. But I still... I still prefer a hands-on approach. That's just the way I am, you know. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see if that does evolve. You know, that idea of through those holographic technologies or virtual reality that we can be in a common space, much more collaborative in that digital world. You know, as a co-op gamer, I really like the analogy to learn from gaming, working together to achieve a goal remotely, And definitely it feels like the technology is already in place to do that from gaming. I'm also really keen to speak about the project timeline. You know, since the Grenfell Tower tragedy, the golden thread of information is now becoming and will be a critical part of providing data, specifically for building safety and fire strategy information. How much in reality is the same set of information evolving and developing across the timeline versus how much is being replicated or rekeyed or duplicated for different stages or, or audiences? There, there, is, there is some duplication uh, in, involved across projects, um, but you'll find um, a lot of that happens on, um, you can say commercial projects or, you know, within the industry, whether you're working on a, a hospital or a school um, you know, a, a sports um, you know project. There's a lot of commonality between projects, so a lot of information can be shared, can be duplicated, 
what I would say is that that information can be refined um, from lessons learned. You know what what we learned on the last last project and how you can add that into the next project so you don't make the same mistakes twice. So th that's I think that that is a general failing as well in the last. You know, a couple of years when I worked in organizations, I hear the term lessons learned uh, quite a lot, but I don't really see it implemented on the next project and the project thereafter. So, you know, that's may maybe one of the, the, the critical meetings, uh, you know, a, a project should have initially. You know, what have they learned on the previous project that they should avoid on the next one? And does that tend to be a time constraint when that isn't happening, that lessons learned aren't being carried into the next project? And what do you think the hurdles are? Yeah, th th there is time involved, but there could be a lack of um, knowledge that that lesson has been undertaken. You know, those lessons learned ha have been undertaken and it needs someone to push those through onto the next project. And the other thing that I find really doesn't help is... Um, the kind of rotation when it comes to, you know, uh, staff members, you know, key personnel. When you when you have great people that have, you know, produced great information or you have great project managers and they move on, you know, to the next project or to the next location or to the next office, then that knowledge gap is missed. You know, that knowledge sharing is missed of the project. Yeah, that does make a lot of sense. And I think the principles you've mentioned there, that hopefully will improve in time as more of the core project collaboration is improved you know across the team i suppose the last in-depth question i had for you in terms of your role and process is one of the things we hear quite often is substitution of product information and how manufacturers objects are used within model information what is your experience of seeing design concept and development being replaced by a manufacturer's product and a digital object, perhaps, and whether that then exists in the final outcome, whether it's substituted, whether it's made into you know generic information again. I suppose, what's your overall perspective on manufacturer content? The projects I've, I've worked on hands-on when it comes to manufacturing projects and replacement with generic objects is that there seems to be currently a mismatch when it comes to uh, models, you'll find that, um, you know, for example, the, the curtain walling might be replaced with the, the manufacturer's um, 3D element, and it's full of data. It's got full of data that can be extrapolated, can be scheduled out, whereas there'll be a lot of other elements that are this kind of generic, very basic, and they won't have the same level of, same level of detail or the same level of information. In, in the model, so there's not a there's not that continuity through the model with regards to data. Uh, I mean, specifiers are great. You know, they're producing fantastic uh, 3D models with great data in it, but it's not being used uh, at the, at the scale it should be within uh, within the models. And also, a lot of the the data gets left out or gets stripped because it's not useful or it's it's not required. Uh, on a project and uh, the, the other um, thing I find that's difficult with a lot of um, specifiers product data is sometimes it's over detailed yeah that it yeah. gets to be too manufactured almost like um, we hear manufacturer scale for fabrication yeah 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 and that that this weighs us down you know the thing is when you have a model let's just say for example I'm at a concept design stage and I'm working on a large facility, whether it's a hospital or a school, and it's a concept design stage, it's a REBA stage two or three maximum. So we're looking at very generic blocks and, you know, this kind of space planning. Um, and then when you start putting in, you know, curtain walls or, you know, other elements, you know, um, Mechan basic mechanical systems, inventory models, and a lot of these, you know, models may have, you know, washers and nuts and bolts. It goes right down to, you know, a lot of detail. You know, you could have the architect's model at LOD2 and then you have the, the mechanical model at LOD4, for example. So you have that, you know, it's just an overload. There, there's, not, there's, there's not that um, consistency across the model. 
And that's where, again, the information manager comes in because they'll produce, uh, you know, a, for example, a, a model prediction delivery table. It'll actually set out the level of detail, the level of information that is required at each stage of the project. So when you have that embedded within the project, then the design discipline knows that, okay, at stage two, Reba stage two, it needs to be at this level of detail. At label at Reba three, it needs to be at this level of detail. So that I think that's where we're coming in. Uh, our input is becoming more and more critical. So getting on to you a bit more personally, one of the things that I mentioned earlier is your posts on LinkedIn, and that you're often sharing your knowledge, whether it's Naviswick tips or, or Revit shortcuts, good practice guides, uh, about BIM process. How important is that to you to educate the community, to share what you know? Why do you do that? Why do I do that? I think um, I do it for the BIM community, but I do it for myself as well. Um, you know, for, for I mean, I've been in the industry a long time. If I learn something, I tend to write it down. I will write it down and I'll produce a guide, whether it's a one-page guide, whether it's a 10-page guide. I know that that, that document is going to come in handy for me on the next project. And to give you the, the best example is that, you know, I, I've mentioned that I'm currently looking at 4D implementation uh, with regards to uh, projects within Jacobs. The last time I looked at 4D was about three, maybe four years ago uh, on, uh, on commercial schemes. And at that time, I produced some videos, I produced some documentation with regards to 4D workflows. How do we take 3D models from the native files, I, you know, for example, IFC or Revit into a 4D platform and we can get a, a 4D simulation and a logistics model. So what I'm finding is that now come three, four years later, I'm going to, I, that all that documentation, all those best practice guides are going to come in handy for myself, you know, they, they'll be they'll be handy for you know, the general public globally, but they'll come in handy for myself as well. You know, I, I produced a guide, it's called 99 Navs Works Tips for Superior Coordination. And in that document, I've more or less listed everything I've learned about Navis Works and about coordination. And now that when I go to a project, and I need to use a checklist, I can just go through my document and check that it conforms to various criteria within my Navis Works tips document. Yeah, it's great, Iftikar. That's fantastic. And I think that awareness that there is a BIM community, an offshoot of the wider built environment professions and the construction industry that has a focus on information management or coordination and these technologies. What's your experience of the BIM community that's been there since the beginning? Do you think it's accelerated a lot in recent years? The community, I think, has always been there in terms of, um, um, you know, 3D, whether it's, you call it 3D graphics, uh, 3D design, you know, 20 years ago, it's always been there, but we become more linked and we can share uh, good information. We can share better information between us, you know. So I, th I think that's only come out through, through, you know, mobile technologies, tablets and, um, you know, better internet connection and so on yeah and clearly you know as we mentioned social media and being able to share that information and connect with others um is such a core part of what you do i wanted to ask you about academia you know your masters and your dissertation how important is an academic element to the role and one question i always have an interest in is could somebody learn the skills entirely on the job and in practice or is it useful to be able to put it into an academic framework as well? Whether you're an engineer, an architect, or a designer, you know, uh, what you produce on a day-to-day -day basis within an organization, nothing beats hands-on experience on a project. The academia side, I know there's, there's a lot of people that say that you don't need to study BIM or you don't need to study a particular subject at, at university or at master's level, and I totally agree. The thing, you know, you can get all that experience hands-on, um, you know, in an office, on, on a, working within a good, good team on a great project. But what I find with academia is it makes me ask questions, you know, through, um, you know, and it makes me look at other areas of BIM and information management that are not connected or currently connected to projects like 
integrated project delivery, you know, lean construction, um, you know, even looking at VR, AR technologies, looking at lean methods, you know, in, in manufacturing, how that can be applied within construction industry, you know, on, on a kind of a typical project, you may never have the chance to look at these things, but with academia, you know, you can. Yeah, what's, what's your perspective on that? So often the examples that get used, or at least the analogies for the industry and how it could evolve, are manufacturing, automotive or aeronautics, the modular and off-site and modern methods of construction will standardize a huge amount of the components we use that will be delivered to site. But equally, buildings are difficult to standardize beyond a certain point. Um, you know, the bridges and tunnels, you know, are all unique. Are you seeing more modular and lean construction and off-site first approaches in the projects you work on? The, the government is proposing to build X number of schools and X number of hospitals. And they're actually looking at MMC, you know, modern methods of construction. They're looking at, um, you know, prefabrication methods as well, even, even robotics. So because the, the, the government is pushing through a lot of these projects, a lot of commercial and private organizations are becoming more and more aware of the benefits of using those technologies and how we can, you know, um, get the project through and built quicker, more efficiently, um, you know, at, at, but still at a very, you know, high level of quality. As somebody asked me the, the question the other day about, you know, what, what would I like to see? And I said, getting the, the 3D model straight to manufacture, you know, fabrication, that, that would be great to be able to see that happen um, but they seem, there's still a lot of steps in between. Yeah, there's there's a lot of steps. It raises that question again about the level of detail and how you develop the model over time so that it's usable for design for manufacture and assembly, but it's not a massive file and it's not weighing the model down when it's not necessary to have too much information or, or detail um, in the object. And I still don't think really the industry's fully solved that. We've mentioned design for manufacturing assembly and modern methods there. We've touched on VR and AR. Um, we haven't mentioned generative design and programming or calculations around carbon and energy consumption. What else in technology in the wider world um, is piquing your interest and, and appeals to you um, and might be things that you want to learn in, in the future? I think definitely sustainability is becoming um, making a more impact on projects with regards to not you know not just the the carbon footprint of an asset, but also right from the very start you know with regards to logistics, um, you know to be used on a project, the you know for example the the steel frame, you know. Where is it coming from? Is it going to leave a carbon footprint? Right through to the specification and the detailing of individual os uh, uh, you know, aspects and elements of, of that asset. So I think sustainability is definitely becoming more and more common. And I expect to see that data more kind of integrated with regards to you know, carbon footprint sustainability on, on projects integrated within the 3D models themselves. And also, I think... Um, Robotics will make a, a, a bigger impact in the future as well once the cost comes down, you know. Um, I mean, we, we're still some time away. I think VR is starting to come through the industry, but, you know, it, it's still re relatively expensive to uh, implement and to use in projects. Yeah, that you need the cost of those technologies to lower to a point where it becomes either universally accessible or more accessible for project use at least. So clearly you're an educator and share your knowledge. Where do you go for information and, you know, what sources are you finding uh, that provide good information? Or do you have particular mentors or colleagues that you look to? I mean, link, LinkedIn is great. You know, there's, there's a lot of uh, great information on LinkedIn. And over the past couple of years, there's there's a lot of online tools as well. You know, there's there's LinkedIn Learning, there's Udacity, there's Udemy. So there, there's a lot of online courses that you can do as well that where you can learn from. 
I think uh, in the end of the day, nothing beats, you know, hands-on learning in terms of projects, you know, learning actually from projects themselves. So you need to be in the in the thick of it. I, or I advise a lot of people to get hands-on experience when it comes to site experience. So any anybody graduating or anybody early on in their career should try and get as much site exposure as they can on projects because that's where a lot of the learning is done. Yeah, that's brilliant. What are your interests outside of work? Are you finding that work's currently taking up most of your time or do you have other pastimes and ways to ensure that you have a, a positive work-life balance? Uh, if, you know, when I'm not producing uh, any guides or, or learning any any new tech, then I think traveling definitely. Um, you know, traveling, whether it's, uh, you know, visiting the, the pyramids in Egypt or looking at the skyscrapers in, in Chicago, you know, I, I do. I, I'm, I'm not the type to go on the same holiday every year, um, and, and unless it's a short distance. But yeah, definitely, I think uh, once we, you know, come out of this um, kind of COVID era, then uh, my expectation would be, or I would love to do a bit more traveling than I have done previously, and uh, you know, visit some of the some some of the great architecture that I see, you know. You know, whether it's the architecture of Europe, you know, in Spain and Germany, or we're looking at the ends of the world, you know, it's um, it's, the, it's, the, it's the quality of the architecture, which I find, uh, you know, inspiring. And I, I, I'm the type of person, not just to look at the whole object, but to look at the detail. So, you know, I, sometimes I'll get impressed just by, you know, how something is joined with an, an element of the structure is joined to another element, what the detailing is like. So for me, um, you know, was it Mies van der Rohe? He said, God is in the detail. Yep, he's absolutely right, you know. You know, there, there was, I think, a house in, uh, I think it was in Amsterdam last week. There was a news feed that was built using a robot and uh, digital manufacturing, the 3D printed house. So th- there's things like that, that, that definitely, you know, um, are, um, you know, pushing the boundary when it comes to, uh, digital technologies yeah the balance between 3d printing and sustainability is going to be interesting over the next few years my final question is one i try to ask everyone which is what are your hopes for the future that could be in a professional sense your ambitions the industry the climate society at large hopes for the future would be maybe you know i'd like to see myself as a kind of a global leader and applying practical bim and VDC on construction projects. So practical with inverted commas, you know, I'm, I'm hands-on. So I want to see the practical application of BIM on, on projects. Plus also I've got now, I'm starting to look at VR and AR, um, you know, with regards to 4D and 5D side of BIM. So I've taken the initial footsteps. So I want to try and master that and implement that on projects. And if I'm not doing that, I'd like to do a bit more traveling, you know, as I mentioned, um, just to get, more exposure and more kind of appreciation of opposite sides of what's happening with regards to digital technologies. You know, in one country, they'll be building something using the the latest robots. And on another side of the world, they'll be doing, you know, hands-on, you know, uh, construction. You know, just uh, that kind of diversity and appreciation. Uh, And that only comes through, you know, traveling and, and exposure. But... Really, um, you know, I, I would like to see myself as a kind of a global leader with regards to BIM and VDC, but not just talking about it. You know, I want to do it as well. You know, not say it, but do it. That is wonderful. Thanks, Iftikar. Yep, thanks very much. And thanks for all you do for uh, digital construction. I really value your time and uh, the conversation we've had today. Thanks so much to Iftikhar for his wise and thoughtful insights into such a critical role in BIM process. I hope you enjoyed it. This episode brings us to the end of Series 1 of Digital Construction Conversations. Do check out our other episodes if you haven't already. We're getting underway with producing the next series and aim to focus on some key aspects of the future of the built environment. If you have any feedback or suggestions, or you think that you have a unique perspective on digital construction and that we could have an interesting conversation, please contact us at podcast at the mbs.com. Please subscribe on your chosen listening platform, press like or leave a review if you can. It really does help more people to discover these conversations. Have a great summer. 
and we'll see you for series two. Thanks and goodbye.